Wonderful. So let me ask, I'm going to start off and because please don't forget to type your questions into the chat box. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question, which I, I normally don't uh, always ask uh, agents, but it, it always amazes me that agents uh, talk about like their favorite books and that sort of stuff. And I just think you must be reading submissions all day long. Like what, how or where do you find the time to read other things? Um, but of course you must, right? You can't just live by submissions alone. My God, your brains would melt, I'm sure. So um, maybe each of one of you could tell us maybe your, um, may maybe make a recommendation for us since everyone is so um, eager, I think, and hungry to read new goods material. So maybe you could tell us like the best recent thing that you, that you read. Um, Joyce, why don't you start since your your picture is in front of me? So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm like that kid that sits in front of the class. Um, well, I was telling my middle grade people that were pitching to me today that uh, that my favorites from last year were a song for a whale and uh, see you in the cosmos. Those were two that I absolutely love. Picture books. It's a little harder to pick a favorite because um, there's so many and they go by so fast. But the last thing I was excited about. Um, was actually a rhyming sort of nonfiction called V is for Voting, uh, mm. because it's by a friend of mine, uh, Kate Farrell, who's an editor, and um, it was a really nice call to action for kids to start thinking about how they can make a change, which we know that we need. Um, and so that that's probably my favorite picture book at this second, you know, five minutes from now. And I, I think to your other question, um, probably all of us admit that we're complete reading addicts. And there's really, until your eyes give out and you get a migraine, you can pretty much just keep reading. So, uh, we, you know, if, if this were a, a live conference, you buy so many books at conferences um, and then you have that stack and then you just, when you go to bed at night, you just start pleasure reading, even though you've been reading all day. It's very, it's amazing how there's an endless appetite for new things yeah. to read. Yeah, that's, it, it is true. I'm, I've been sharing with people this week too. I'm teaching a class right now where I'm reading student manuscripts, uh, novel manuscripts, and I'm still, I'm reading at night too. So I'm reading the manuscripts during the day and I'm reading other stuff at night. So I know sometimes it just, you kind of have to. So um, Priya, how about you? What was the, what was the most recent thing you read that you really loved? Oh my gosh. If I tell you I have like four books half read, <laughs> the worst. But I, I think as an agent, you know, we can say that we, in, in some ways, it's good to read, you know, like read three chapters here and then I'm in another book and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, I did, I, um, I did love um, Amy Bonifons. I'm not sure if any of you ladies or gentlemen are familiar with um, the writer. She, um, I absolutely fell in love with her writing. I think she's tremendous. Um, the book that was published this year is called The Regrets. Mm. Um, yeah, she's just absolutely terrific, very original, um, just really sharp storytelling. Um, you know, I, I, I really loved it. And then I, I also, I've also read her short story collection, which was, it's interesting because she debuted with a short story collection. And as you all know, oh my gosh, that's impossible to do. But um, with her, I can see why she debuted with it. Um, it's called The Wrong Heaven, absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, I really loved it. Um, loved her. And then, of course, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of, uh, I think it's Shuggy Bane or Shuggy Bane. I'm not sure how to say it. Douglas Stewart. Um, it's up for all kinds of prizes. I would highly, highly recommend it. Superb writing. Uh, he's amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a wonderful world to be in. And um, I think he's been shortlisted for the Booker and the National Book Award. Like, wow. That's, that's really brilliant. Um, and then I'm all, and then I did read The Burning by Mega Majumdar. Um, really, you know, really interesting book. Made a lot of noise this year. Um, I think she was also long listed for the National Book Awards. And um, very, very well written. Um, so that's done. And I'm, um, what, else, what else am I reading? Oh gosh. Um, I have a couple of more, but move on. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Jim, how about you? Um, okay, so I'll try and <laughs> keep it really <laughs> short. For picture books, Because You Matter, which is spectacular, and I feel like everybody should read it, young, old, um, any race. Um, middle grade, I'm kind of in a spooky, I think it's October, so I read Hide and Seeker, which is 
which is really fun. And it's good to, if you're studying craft, to, you know, find these books that have really great voice for middle grade, because it's, it's really hard to do. Um, YA Cemetery Boys. Um, adult, I just read Mexican Gothic, but there is a book that I return to often. And so I'm just going to say the De Department of Speculation is my absolute favorite. Um, I don't think it's anything anybody could read for craft to emulate, but just if you want something to enjoy, um, for real, check that out. Yeah, we read that in my one of my classes. I teach a class in the spring where the students just write a down and dirty draft of a novel in a semester. Yeah. You know, it's horrible, it's full of holes, but they have a draft. <laughs> <laughs> um, I assign really short books for them to read while mm -hmm. they're doing that. And the Jenny Offal, we read that last uh, spring and it was fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and Gina, how about you? Um, Ashley, I've been spending the pandemic catching up on all of the reading that people recommended to me that I hadn't had time for. Um, and I'm doing that with audiobooks because I can I can read a book a day in audio while I'm driving or or doing or working out or whatever. And it's been really really creative. So I've allowed you know I've, I've had a chance to dive deep into like um, Darius the Great is not okay and and why that's so amazing and Lee Verdugo and like the Ninth House which is very to, you know, it's, it's very atmospheric for Halloween and, and October and uh, just exploring CJ Box because I love stories that are set in very specific environments and that, that very rural kind of uh, mystery and getting to understand the life of people that farmers and ranchers and people that we don't really get to see and, and get to interact with on a daily basis. So I've kind of been Staying, like you know staying in that space and getting familiar with the books that people have told me they read and they loved and I hadn't had a chance to read yet um, and it's been fantastic I mean I, I finally listened to Hillbilly Elegy you know fantastic which that is a world I actually know really well having lived for years deep deep in the Ozarks so I, I really love this this is a fantastic experience and I think uh, more of us are doing that because publishers are saying and this booksellers are saying backlist is where it is at during the pandemic publishers are selling their backlist they've, they've kind of moved a lot of their big books into later in the fall and they've really been been digging deep and selling backlist so I'm trying to get into that backlist and see you know where where we're at so this, that's been fun you know so that's that's just me <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, ask a couple questions. I'm gonna, um, we've got some questions here in the chat and I'm gonna, um, so if you have other questions, people, please uh, put them in. First, I'm gonna ask Erin uh, Kelly to ask her question. Hi. Um, yes, my question is for Jem because she specifically mentioned verse novels, which I know is a growing, um, you know, part of the industry. So I'm curious, do you find that publishers are increasingly looking for them, especially since the Newbery Honor book? Or and what are some of the biggest issues that you see that that cause you or maybe editors to pass? Um, well, novel and verse is big and booming. I think um, I at least for all of the editor meetings I've had, it's maybe I would say every meeting someone is asking for it in the middle grade, especially in that space. Um, I think it comes down to what it's really about, what essentially is going on in the story. There has to be a reason why it's in verse versus prose, um, and there has to be at the heart of the story something genuine um, and heartbreaking, um, and in a good way, not like heartbreaking, but like melt your heart, family stories or friendship stories. Um, and abandonment or grief, things that, that someone is going through. I think um, Sharon Creech has, I think it's called heartbreaking or heartbeating. I don't know, I'm, I'm in the middle of reading it right now, which is really great. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a hit or miss like everything else. Um, but I think if you find a great editorial agent, someone who is willing to kind of dig into the poetry, um, I think you'll have good chances. Thanks, Erin. Um, we have a question from Maggie Friedenberg. Maggie, will you ask your question, please? Oh, 
Um, so my question is, how polished should my manuscript be before I start querying agents? Like, should I have it professionally edited first or is just my own revisions enough? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, I, I don't think you absolutely have to hire a professional editor. That's not economically feasible for many new writers. Um, but definitely you should, you need to feel that this is a polished draft. Don't send out first draft. Send it through, I mean, workshop with people, published authors in your genre. Um, you can meet them if you don't have friends that are that are published, well published in your genre. Join the professional organizations, join SCBWI, join, um, you know, uh, romance writers, join mystery writers. So, and make friends, network with friends, because there, there's a lot of very generous writers out there who are going to take your book in hand and help you and work with you. Um, but you definitely need to feel confident. Um, but you know, a good critique group of people in your in your field. They have to be people who write your genre. And if you can have people who are always of a higher level of expertise than you are, you want people. You want to always aspire to better and better. So you want to work with people you know are better than you. So um, get deeply involved in in the writing organization specific to your genre. Make lots of friends. Take advantage of everything they have to offer as far as services. Um, because you definitely want to make sure you're putting your best foot forward because you only have one chance to make a first impression. Yeah, anyone else want to add, have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I, I want to reinforce that. The, the competition is so fierce. And again, that's, so, you know, in basket is, is a, a battlefield. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of people competing with you on a given day to get my attention. So. Um, you know, we look at the pitch, of course, to think if it's a hook that's going to work. And then the next thing we are doing is looking at the text to see how polished you are. And so it, it, this is a competitive sport. So the best you can make, especially the beginning, whatever you're showing in your query, um, don't, you know, measure twice, cut once. Don't, don't send it out when you're really not sure. Um, definitely try to get it as best you can. And it's not always something that we will answer if we're passing. We may not always say, well, your writing wasn't quite, you know, that's, that's not typically said. I've had people come circle back and say, could you tell me why you passed? And then I might say it, but we don't always say that proactively. So um, you, you really need to get it to a, a nice high level. I just want to co-sign on, on all of those things. You know, yes, critique groups for sure do that. Um, and yes, this is a first impression. This is essentially your one-on-one -on -one with us. Um, and, you know, just to do a numbers game, in three months, I had 1,300 submissions. And so when you think of that, like, how many of, how much of the percentage can I take on as clients? I can't even take on 1% in those three months. So you have to make sure you get it as polished. Sure, if you're missing a comma, or maybe there's a comma splice, I'm not going to be like, okay, well, this is a pass. But for sure, make sure your story is there, especially your first chapter. I mean, all of it should be, but your first chapter, if you're not hooking and drawing your reader in, which is me or the other agents you're curing, it's, it's gonna be really hard because we might only have those 10 pages. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Mullen has a question. Michael, will you ask your question, please? Sure. I'm happy to. Um, so I'm a middle grade writer and I focus on writing about my nieces and my nephews. And uh, I've written three stories this year um, for my nephews. And I developed a really great story for my niece. Uh, she's a fantastic character. She's the first one of the kids that's been born while I've been part of the family. Um, so we have a very strong connection. And I want to write her as a character in one of my books, but I'm hearing a ton of stuff that obviously I'm a guy. Um, I shouldn't be writing female characters, which kind of puts me off. But also in the one book that I'm querying, one of the two books that I'm querying right now, um, my female character is more loved by everybody who's read it. So I'm kind of not sure what I should do. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I would love to hear from all of you about this, because um, this, this goes not just to sort of like gender, but also... Um, all kinds of things that have to do with own voices and sensitivity. And so, so maybe we can expand your answer a little bit to kind of uh, 
maybe you could just share with us what you think is happening right now in the publishing industry and how we need to go about this in our uh, the best way so okay I'm, I'm happy to sort of jump in um, I personally don't have um, an issue with that um, you know uh, because I represent um, men who who have uh, who, who have a, a, a woman protagonist um, and I've represented women who've had men protagonists um, so my, I, I personally do not have issues with that, but I do know that um, there are editors in publishing houses um, who, and again, this is not a blanket. There are some, you know, it's, it's very specific. Um, you know, I've had, I've sent my queries and, and I've gotten feedback saying this is, you know, the writing is really great, but I wonder why, um, you know, the, the, the man, the, the male author didn't write about a father, but instead he wrote about a mother as a protagonist, right? Which, you know, to me is, okay, that's interesting. That's your take on it. That's fine. Um, and it could be for a whole host of reasons as to why she sort of felt that and, and why she declined that book. Um, but, um, but Michael, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, an expert in middle grades. So I'm not sure how how that's received and, and there's some wonderful agents here who do it and they, I'm sure they'll give you a better understanding of it. But um, I've, I've had no issues with it personally. And I have sold books that have written, you know, and it could be gender or, or whatever else we're talking about, right? Subject matter in nonfiction, especially, I know Gina will, will tell you um, so much of it is about that. Um, but it, interestingly, I have a, a great story to share. Um, I represented this wonderful American writer who wrote um, historical fiction um, and, and it was, it was, British, um, you know, historical. And it was it was wonderful, and you, you won't believe I got rejected by all the UK um, publishers because they said, "Well, she's not a British person writing it," and you know, yeah, I was like, "Wow, okay," <laughs> but that's that's outside of the United States market. Um, so it just it's I think it's a bit all over the place. Um, and in terms of the you know the, the big American dirt controversy, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, Eddie, I would love to hear from the rest of you about what you think. Thanks. Thanks, Bria. Uh, about, you know, about what's going on. There's a, it's big conversation. And boy, if you dig your toe into the Twitterverse, you better put your seatbelt on because it's going to be a ride, right? So, um, and some people get, I mean, it's a, it's an important question and it's something that at conferences like this where we have like over 60 people in this meeting, like we need to be talking about it. So I want to hear from, from the rest of you guys about um, your a the agents. I'm sorry. I'm really trying hard not to say you guys is my Midwestern upbringing. So I apologize. I, I would like to hear from the rest of the agents about sort of your experiences with um, uh, own voices and representation and, and characters and that sort of stuff. So I've had definite experiences with publishers where it's dependent on what the, the, the subject is, whether it's acceptable for a man to write a woman protagonist. I had an exceptional book about surrogacy written by two men. One of them was a physician who dealt with the issues and another was his writing partner was a guy who's in fact, his family had dealt with surrogacy. And, but they, publishers did not want to have a book even if it was spectacular, that had two male writers writing about the issue of surrogacy. Um, so it, it's very dependent. It's very dependent. Like, you know, normally I think with children, when it's middle grade, like Michael's book, I think that it's much less uh, dependent on, um, you know, the, the gender of the author. Um, because I think that it, it's, but if it was about, you know, our girl's first period, you're probably going to want to have that from a female writer. Okay. But, but, uh, so it's very much dependent on that. But when it comes to own voices, we just had this, we had a, I don't know, a roving gun battle on Twitter recently um, about the, whether or not anyone, anyone has the right to write another culture's experience right from that perspective of the, of the other culture. Um, and that's become the sticking point for publishers and publishers are very, very nervous. And I've had publishers turn down books that went on to auction and had three bidders, but they had the six people who said, I'm not going anywhere near that subject. <laughs> um, so it, it has, it's, they're afraid of, they're afraid of being, uh, completely silenced on Twitter. They're, they're ha or having to withdraw a book that they've already announced. Um, we need to be very sensitive and we need to have subjects, uh, discussed openly. Um, 
about whether or not it's, it's appropriate for someone to write the experience. We, I had a debate with somebody who said, well, but the author was immersed in the culture. And I said, but you have to remember, they may have been immersed in the culture, but they're experienced through their own lens of their own background. So it's not really that they understand it from, as well as the people who are the impacted culture. So it's, it has become, I think we've become more and more sensitive to the fact that the representation may not be as accurate as it needs to be, as empathetic, as sympathetic, and as accurate. So, um, you know, we, we need to start thinking more about that. However, we cure that. I, I don't think it means that we necessarily have to block all writers from writing anyone who's not their own exact background because that would be super boring. <laughs> but we, we do need to make sure that we're we're taking care to be accurately and sympathetically representing the, the person you know, that we're writing about. I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joyce, Jem, I would love to hear from, from you. Yeah. Um, I feel like for middle grade, as long as you're not talking about like your main character is not, if there's nothing about body changes, you know, the things that, that females are going through during, yeah, then you're fine. I wouldn't have a problem with it. And I don't think, you know, many editors from middle grade, sure, YA and adult, it's a different thing. And if we're talking about race or ethnicity, you know, and own voices. I feel like that is a completely different thing. It's it's even larger than, you know, someone speaking out um, from a culture that's different from theirs. It's also the fact that if we look at it, like history of the publishing industry, marginalized voices are such a very small number. And I mean, I'm talking about where the writer is talking about their own culture, their own background. And I think it's, this is just a time where we're, you know, a lot of writers are saying, it's, it's our turn to tell our own story, please and thank you. And I think that we need to respect that. Mm -hmm. But I, that doesn't mean that you can't have other characters in your book that don't represent all of those like our lives now like our friends and our co-workers and even all the faces on this screen why can't your book be as diverse you can do that for sure you just have to take care when you're doing dialogue and you know if you have those characters visiting that culture space you do have to take care do your research you know get sensitivity readers um be careful um but other than that i think as far as your question specifically, Michael, I think you're good. Thank you. And Joyce, do you have anything to add? I have uh, passionate feelings on every side of this question, <laughs> 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 on both sides. Um, because I, as an author, I was a gender switcher. I, my most successful books were boys' books, and there was no one ever asked a question. You know, so it, it wasn't an issue. It was what I could do. It was what I could, I could imagine being a boy better than being a girl. So, okay, well, maybe I'm non-binary, who knows? But the, <laughs> the point is, um, I think right, just to, to be specific to your question first, um, I am not seeing any pushback in middle grade or picture book about gender. Um, as far as ethnicity, absolutely. Um, so you're, right now you're good. I, things are shifting, people get nervous, there's a lot of tension. Nobody wants to put out a book that's gonna be attacked and that's, Part of the fear that the publishers are having so they're like they're super conservative or super careful i should say about what they're doing but it, overall this movement is so important um you know that in the past it was people who did have white privilege writing about other cultures because you know they could and selling because they could and taking jobs away from people who knew the culture i think that was horrible and that needed to be corrected and this is a big correction that's valuable um, and I'm happy for the people of color on my list that they have really great, they get requested. They super get requested. It makes me very happy because in the past it wouldn't have been that way. So it's a good thing. Um, I think we also have to start to talk about the fact that we're all not one thing. Like a lot of us are very mixed up uh, hodgepodges of things. So it's, it gets confusing. Like, do I have to bring my uh, Ancestry.com report and, and prove that I'm partly Portuguese, or can I just say it? Is it okay? Uh, so, you know, it gets to a point where it's this is could borderline get silly, uh, and we don't want it to. We want to say if you can write a culture properly, 
and you have a reason you can write that culture properly, maybe it's okay. But I think right now, you know, if someone in the culture is writing about it, they should get first place. They should, and, and, and but as far as gender, I'm a little fuzzier on that because I, I don't think it's the same issue. I don't think it's quite the same issue. And I hope that doesn't turn into something too strict because I don't think it should be that way. Well, thank you all for, for sharing because it is a really important conversation um, that we all, all need to be having. Um, it's interesting, I was at a workshop a few years ago. It was all women, it was a women's workshop, uh, big conference, like it was like a big long week long conference. All the teachers were women, all the attendees were women. And uh, I was in a, a very, uh, I don't know, you had to apply to be in this particular fiction workshop. And so it was 10 women with this well-known teacher who was quite elderly at the time. And she basically, there were a couple of people who were writing uh, young adult middle grade uh, novels with male protagonists. And she just like really let them have it. She was like, you know, men have been writing their own stories forever. Why can't you should be, I mean, and people were kind of like, yo, <laughs> dial it back. Like I gotta write the story I have to write, you know, I can't. So I, I appreciate what all of you have had to say. Um, and you know, she was just coming at it from a hardcore feminist perspective. And and this was a few years ago, really before the own voices conversation really came to the fore. And so she was really just talking about like how the publishing industry has been so dominated by men and you know, why why wouldn't we wanna, you know, put out, you know, female protagonists. I was lucky my protagonist was and antagonists were women, so I didn't get that feedback from her. So, <laughs> but um, some of the women, I felt really bad for them because their stories were great. And it's like, and it's a whole different thing, right? When you're writing middle grade and young adult, it's so hard to engage boys to read that it's important that stories come from their point of view, um, kind of no matter who is really writing, writing the stories. Um, okay, I have, let's see. Um, some other questions here I, I'm kind of want to make sure um let's see here okay so Christine uh Newlieb will you ask your question please sure um hi everyone thanks for everything you said um so this is a little bit of an, an oddball question because I'm on the editorial side of things I am the editorial director of Lantern Fish Press in Philadelphia um and but hopefully this is a question that will be also useful to anyone who's written something sort of niche and offbeat and is maybe like a good fit for a smaller, more independent press. Um, I've worked so far with mostly unagented authors. Like we have open submissions twice a year and like the volume of that is increasing and increasing. And like every once in a while I get a pitch from an agent, but like I haven't like worked much with agents so far. Um, and I was curious if any of you work with small independent presses, like, um, or what would influence you to pitch a book to a smaller press rather than a bigger one? I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, I actually love indie presses. I've actually sold to um, a few indie, independent presses. Um, I think um, for, for the independent press to get on the map, um, you know, one way to do it is Publishers Marketplace. Um, so it's it's a good way for us agents to know because many times we might not even know of the existence of a serious independent press and i think that's and we're all sort of tuned into uh, publishers marketplace so i think that's a good way for you to elicit agents um you know uh, it really helps because i'm constant i mean I, I look at the deals every single day and i'm always curious to click on um a publisher that I have never heard of before and you know and then I'll, I'll do research on Google and I'll you know I'll see who the writers are and um, so I'm I'm a big fan of indie presses because I feel a bit also because I do a lot of um, own voices diverse multicultural um, and it's been you know it's really challenging to get it to the Penguin Random Houses and HarperCollins for you know a whole host of different reasons which we don't have time to get into but I found time and again that an independent press fully understands and backs it up and does a really good job of publishing that work. Um, and, and most of my authors are just, you know, they're, they're happy when they, when they find that expertise, right? Um, so 
So yay to independent presses. I'm a, like I said, I'm a big fan. Um, and really just get yourself on the map. I think there are ways to do it. For example, start with publisher and marketplace. Um, and, and you'll, and, and you'll, you will see a rise in, in agent submission. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm fairly new, but I am definitely open, you know, to, to smaller independent presses because the reality is sometimes you, it's our client, it's up to our clients where they essentially want to go, but sometimes they don't want to be a tiny fish in a big pond. They want to be a lead title and they want to be marketed and they want to feel like their book matters. And sometimes that means not submitting to Macmillan and, you know, Penguin and all of the big five. It means let's look at smaller presses, but we have to know, you know, where to find you is, is essentially, you know, the idea. But yeah, I'm, I'm not against it. Of course not. Yeah, I would, I would say that I like to send my clients out to a mix of, of big and small, especially the first round, just to find out you know, who's, who's saluting this flag. So um, I, I love to find out about small presses and it is a little difficult for us to always find you or know about you. And I would say, I take further, reach out to us because I have had several small presses that reached out to me. We got on a phone call. I found out things about their platform and their distribution that were better than I would have guessed. And, you know, I have a different feeling about submitting to them. So uh, but that's sometimes that's a time a time when we need almost a one-on-one -on -one conversation because we understand how the big five work but we don't always know how you're promoting or how you're doing things so it'd be great i would love to be to have you reach out and reach out to other agents because i think we want to learn and if you're once you're in our little list you know you'll get a lot of great things so do it thanks thank you um, and Lantern Fish is from here, here in Philly, and they're doing great stuff. So, um, well, they're not, you're, well, some of you guys are in Philly, right? I don't want to say the wrong thing. I'm sorry, Kit, Christy. Um, so I know Feliza Casano is here, so in Philadelphia. Um, she's part of Lantern Fish. All right, I'm going to stop babbling about Lantern Fish. I'm sorry. Um, Jonathan, uh, Coven, will you ask your question, please? Hi. Um... So I was just wondering, what do you consider a good query letter? What, what makes a query letter good enough that you would be interested in taking the full manuscript? Um, okay. Um, for me, well, I read the query letter and I still read the sample for sure. But a good query letter, that first paragraph, I, I need to know genre word count, all of, you know, title, the good stuff. Um, the second paragraph, I need to know the main character, the conflict, the stakes. Um, that's what's really going to get me excited about those sample pages. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, obviously, then the sample needs to hold up and then I'll request. Um, well, actually, I'm lying. I will then go back and read the synopsis because then I want to know how it ends. I want all the spoilers. And then that's when I will request a full from there. Uh, yeah, I want to throw in a follow-up question if I can, and, and Jem, you can answer this and uh, other agents can. Uh, so let's say you get the um, a request. If you're an author, you get a request for a full read. How long should you wait until you send a follow-up? Um, or should you send a follow-up? Or if you you know, what's the protocol if someone, if an agent asks for a full read of a manuscript? You're asking if they can nudge us, like ask us, you know. Yeah, I mean, how long does it usually take you to read a manuscript and then get back to an author after you ask for a full read? <laughs> um, I don't know. I would say if, if you're ever querying me and I ask and I request for a full, you can nudge me after eight weeks. But okay. I am like, drowning I, I just think you know be nicer to us like we're nicer to the editors because with covid like i have three kids at home and homeschooling and just life is different um and i think it's kind of different across the board for all of us and we're also maybe at least some of us are seeing or all of us are seeing more submissions so you know j just give us some time but i'm never you know grumpy about it 
much. I'm always like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I promise I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but yeah, eight weeks for me at least. Okay. Uh, and Joyce, how about you? Both questions. Um, a query, I, I want to know that you know who I am. Um, because, you know, sometimes I'll get a query that says, you know, I've written a sex manual for senior citizens and <laughs> as a picture book rep, I just, I don't know what to do with that. So that annoys me. So, you know, at least you should know, you should go to our website and look me up and know something about me. Um, that makes me happier. And then we look for the hook. We look for why you're, you know, because we are reading so many pitches every day uh, and we see the same and the same and the same. So you better find some way that it's like, oh, wait, that's interesting. And then third, you go to the writing sample I do and, you know, see if it's like completely top quality because it should be. If you're querying an agent, it should be. So those are the things. Uh, as far as follow-up, what I do when I request is I give a vague, and I mean vague, idea <laughs> of what my backlog is at that moment um, so that they are level set. So it's like if, if it's summer and I say I'll be reading that sometime in mid-fall, then that is a clue. Don't don't check with me in two weeks. It's not going to happen. Uh, now we recently got a bunch of interns at our agency and all of a sudden it's so wonderful because they're doing reader reports and it's going faster. So that so now it's different. But when I first started it, I had a huge, I had like a three or four month backlog. I don't mind a nudge anytime. It's fine. If I've requested you, uh, you have a right to talk to me. It's not like don't bother me because we're I requested you. So you have a right to ask. So it, it doesn't take me but two seconds to say not yet, but here's where you are in the queue. Now there's five people ahead of you, or whatever it is. I think that's well within what we, we should be expected to do. So, you know, as long as you give us a reasonable lead time before you start nudging. And of course, if anything, you know, good is happening for you, we want to know because we will rotate for sure. <laughs> right. So it uh, maybe two months is good time. Good. I think that's a good baseline. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Priya, how about you? So um, the question of the query letter, um, I, you know, um, I think um, for me, it's, it's really keep it simple. Um, you know, try not to be too funny because I don't know who you are. And you, you, you know, you might be a really funny person, but, but until I get to know you, I don't know that. And it sometimes can, it, it can be read, you know, the wrong way. Um, yeah, it's just super simple. I just need, um, and it's exactly what Joy said, like, make sure you follow the website. It's really very, very important. Like, do you know, follow directions because if I get a submission that does not have the simple requirements that I've sort of asked for, I, I probably will not, um, I don't know, like want to read further, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's important and, and they're simple directions. So definitely research the, um, the agent and I think it'll, it also helps to do um, like specialized um, queries because when I see um, a query which says, dear, you know, dear Priya Daraswamy, um, I saw that you represented this writer or I, I, I read this, this book that you represented and I just fell in love with this book because of one or two reasons, I'm invested, right? I'm like, okay, th this writer um, is serious about wanting me to represent him or her and, I'm, and they've spent the time, so I'm willing to spend an extra half an hour or two to read the entire query and even the sample chapters. So, I think it really helps. Um, you know, sometimes it's literally a, a matter of taking that extra 20 minutes. Um, it makes a huge difference to an agent, at least to me. Um, I like it, um, you know, a, a short synopsis of, of your uh, bio. Um, you know, it can be a paragraph or two. Um, and if you don't have writing cred, that's fine. Don't feel intimidated that you don't have anything. If you're, you know, it's okay. I mean, I understand you're a debut writer um, and I'll, I'll, read your, I'll read your sample. So it's fine, you know, it's fine. Um, the synopsis is what exactly like Jem said, I, I'd like to know the whole story. I have to know the ending. Don't not send me the ending because I'm like, what? Um, so yeah, and just, I would say, you know, present tense, keep it simple. It's, it's easy. Um, and sorry, the other question was, how long does it take? Um, you know, I've gotten back to um, writers within three days, within a week, and sometimes it takes me two months. But I always tell writers, you know, I'm always open to nudging and I always um, ask if it's a multiple submission because I understand that, you know, there are other agents reading it. I'm fine with it. And I always let them know to let me know if they've elicited interest or um, representation. So then I can sort of fast track it and, you know, 
And typically um, in the agent world, it's, it's just good courtesy. Like let's say you've got an offer for representation and you've sent it out to five other agents to let the other agents know, hey, um, can you get back to me? I have to get back to the offering agent in a week. That's just, it's just, it's just good etiquette. And I always encourage that, you know, if I offer representation and the, and the writer's like, oh, I, I have multiple, I'm like, go for it. I'll give you a week, 10 days, just get, get back to me. So yeah, that's, that's my spiel. Awesome. Thank you. And Gina, how about you? Uh, okay. In the query, in the very first line, I want a log line that's going to blow me out of the water. Okay. I want to see that you know your market, that you know your competition. I want to know your comp titles and I want them to be spot on perfect. They don't have to be the best selling book of the week. I want it to be, uh, you know, two, three comp titles that are absolutely perfect for your book and for your place in the publishing, you know, uh, world right now. Debut authors, don't comp yourself to somebody who's a best selling author because they're selling on name at this point. So, so show me, show me that you really are immersed in your genre. I want conflicts, conflict, stakes, and motives. That's what comes across. That's what draws the reader in. That's what compels us to keep reading. Conflict, stakes, and motives. We, if we understand that about the story, if we understand that about the protagonist, you're going to pull us through. So nice and concise, one page. Let me know your word count. Let me know your genre. Let me know that you know who your reader is, who your comp competition is, um, where your book is going to sit on the shelf. And if you've shown me that you've done that research, I'm going to feel much more confident in you as a storyteller. So, I mean, it's, it, you don't have to be an experienced published author. You can be a debut author and still do all of that work. You show me you've dug in and done the research and you really know your market because you're going to be somebody who can, who can take that reader through a story they're going to enjoy. So, um, that's pretty basic, but there's a lot of work to get there. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So how long does it take you to read, uh, do, do, when you do a full read? Oh, uh, you know, it can, it depends on whether or not if, if I get a book in that I just requested and I just had a conversation with an editor that she's looking for that, I'm going to read it right away. I'll read it. I may read it the day I get it. And I've done that and I responded. And there are other times when I, I ask for something because it's sort of a passion piece, but I know that the market is very weak for it. And I'm sorry, but that's going to go way back on my, on my read list. And it could be months and months before I get back on that, because I know it's going to be a long uphill slog to sell that book. So we're in business. We are business people. We're looking to make careers for our authors. So we're probably immensely triaging the work as it comes in and understanding we have to read things that are timely and topical. And yes, we have that fear of missing out. So we know that this book is going to go to somebody fast. We want to move it quickly. So, you know, I'm moving things around in my queue. I hate to say that because it might be discouraging to writers, but we probably all do it to some degree. We have to triage our list to understand this book's got to get top priority. This one that's going to be a long, hard slog. It's going to go down to the bottom. So, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, it, this is what we need to hear. This is important information. So thank you for being honest. Appreciate it. Um, so Mitchell has a question. Um, Mitch, you want to ask your question? Are you really just kind of asking about multiple points of view? You're muted. Mitch. Sorry. Okay. As I was saying, I it it, it grows out it goes out of the thing we were talking about earlier um, about you know who the protagonist should be and who has a who should be writing that, um, and I was wondering whether doing multiple points of view um, gets g overcomes that that hassle that burden. Um, that was that was my question. Anybody want to? Thanks, Mitch. Um, would you say it kind of falls back to what we were talking about that you don't necessarily have to worry quite so much about gender it's more about culture well there's a there's a cultural issue too because it's set in colonial pennsylvania and there's a native american character who's one of the four main points of view right yeah does anyone want to tackle that all right that's going to be tough mitch and um it, we've had a lot a lot of sensitivity um readers what come back it? oh it's this like, i'm like something keeps about um about, to me today i'm sorry okay please uh please mute your mic thanks are we good all right i've had a lot of stories i do a lot of historical <laughs> fiction i love historical fiction and i teach a workshop about it um accurate representation of 
uh, Native American characters is so important and it's almost never done correctly, almost never done correctly. Um, I would suggest, honestly, that if you're going to use a Native American as a point of view character, that at the very least you have a reader, a, a sensitivity reader who's, who's um, within the tribe that will uh, read the book and make sure that you're accurately representing because I had a book that was, I was otherwise very impressed with the writer's background. He had a great pedigree, he was multi-published and he was using offensive, offensive terms that shocked me that he didn't understand that the community, the Native American community would have found these terms to be outlandish. So we are ignorant largely even even still today of a lot of the issues that that go into this so i think that if you're going to include this as a pov character make sure you have people reading this from that community from that tribe specifically uh, who can tell you whether or not it's it's accurate and it's sympathetic and and it's most of all not offensive yeah i think that's great advice thank you gina yeah, yeah it's just maybe just finding um seeing if you can find some sensitivity readers how, how would I go about doing that other than like, I mean, how, how does, does, can you get that? Is there, are there people who do that on a regular basis that you pay them to and they, they give you that kind of a read? There are, there are people who put themselves out there as sensitivity readers, um, or you could simply approach um, people within um, that, that tribal community, tribal leaders. Um, to ask them if they could recommend somebody who could do it. Jonathan's saying Facebook writer groups, good job. Um, you know, I, I think that the closer you can get to um, making sure that the reader has the background you want, the better. So, I mean, I definitely would, would ask for the, the creds on the reader. I've had people volunteering to be sensitivity readers who I felt really didn't have the background and credentials to, to be doing what they were doing. Understand sensitivity reading, just like anything else, is one person's opinion. And 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 you know, sometimes it, it does it doesn't necessarily mean that they speak for everyone in the community. If you if that sensitivity reader um, comes back saying this is offensive or this doesn't work for me. So I would I would try to get a, a couple of readers, but you know, if you can go to leaders within that community, if it's if it's a different religion, if it's, you know, you're writing about Orthodox Jews, may go to that community and get, you know, leaders in the community to recommend people who could do it. Or, you know, so you're making sure that you're going to an authority, go to an authority within that, that community who can help recommend people that they, that they trust, because they're going to be the people who are going to come back and complain if it's done wrong. You know, you're going to be, that, that's, that's where you're going to be that's hearing That's where I get from. Twitter bombed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It happens. It happens. Yes. So yeah. you want to, and, and, you know, you want to make sure that you've gone to the source to get your information. And, oh, and look, your book. One problem that I'm going to have is that the tribe no longer exists. They are, they, they went, they disappeared as a result of the things that I'm writing about. Well, mm -hmm. so Mitch, what I'm going to say is, cause I, I want to make sure we, we get in the rest of our questions. Yeah. And we can talk offline about this. I got some yeah. ideas for you, maybe. And, um, but, uh, you know, there definitely would be other, I mean, I've read Mitch's novel and I think it's a really important book and I think it would be great, but I think it's also gonna need that, you know, stamp of approval and, and all that sort of stuff. So I got some ideas for you, buddy. We'll, we'll talk. All right, Mitch, real quick, it's it's gonna be hard, but maybe you could also do a third person and pull back and be really distant when you're in that POV. Um, but still, I, it, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a hard one. Yeah, it's a the story is a hard, it's a tough story. Like it sounds like if people are looking for upbeat things, it might be, I mean, you know, it's about a massacre. It look it's a bad, it's a it's a tough story. Um, it's about colonial white settlers and Native Americans, and those stories don't usually end well. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, my friend. Um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I would like, let's see, Michael had a question about, um, about picking a genre, and um, so I'm going to ask uh, Michael to ask his question, and then I have like a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, to, to go along with with Michael's question. Michael, will you ask your question? 
Um, so last year, Push the Published, I spoke to during this conference, um, and I asked about focusing on a specific type of book, and I was told that I should pick a genre. Like, I have adult, middle grade, romance, I have everything. Um, so I was told I should pick a genre, and I focused on middle grade, and I have been told by everybody that reads my books that my fantasy is by far the best. But right now, I'm querying a, an epic fantasy, a uh, another off-brand fantasy and a contemporary fantasy and I was just kind of wondering if for branding or for finding an agent if I should focus more on staying with contemporary or staying with the epic fantasy or is it okay to stay broad to you know meet that gambit or gambit excuse me can't spell it either thank you <laughs> thanks Michael yeah Joyce can you um, yeah uh, when I'm taking on a client um, I often like to know that they can follow up on something that's branded with the project that they're pitching to me. And I also, it's extra credit if they have something that we can pivot with, because then I have all my options and I have my option book ready. And then I also have, uh oh, something's going wrong. Let's try this book. Now that's a lot of with picture books and shorter pieces. So it may be different for the people that are dealing with adult authors that that might be a totally different thing. But um, and I'll also say that at our agency, um, we do a lot of client sharing. Like if you write romance and you write middle grade, you might become my client, but we might share uh, with another agent uh, to market your other things. And I don't know of other agencies where that happens a lot. So if you're very all over the place, uh, check out the Seymour agency. We do a lot of that. <laughs> That's good to know, because I that was a question, and that's that kind of goes leads into my follow up questions, and maybe you guys, the the rest of the agents, can weigh in on this. So I've been told by agents as well, um, when I've had conversations like this with them, that really um, because you know writing is such a business that they want you to really as uh, they really want you to focus in one specific genre, especially if you're writing adult fiction. So if your first your first book is a uh, let's say a, a cozy mystery, then they and it and it hits pretty big. They want you to write cozy mysteries forever, even if you want to write uh, you know literary thriller. So um, I just wondered if you would speak to that and like how important is that? Does it really go from agent to agent or agency to agency or? Um, so, so with Michael, like he's talking about even subcategories within fantasy, right? And it seems like, I don't know. So what do, you, what do the rest of you think about that, Jim? What is, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think it comes down to agent. I mean, you need to do your research, find an agent that um, probably wants all of those things. Um, I have a couple clients who write YA and then also write adult. And like the YA is a more suspense thriller and the adult is romance. And I don't have a problem with that. And both of those clients are veterans who've been with other agents and have multiple books already. So it's it just depends, I think, it, what it comes down to is the agent and the agency. Now, I don't know if you're gonna also write picture books and you know do all of the things. I mean, yeah, that might eventually come down to like, okay, how, how do we brand you? But I, there are so many writers out who, who do go through different age groups and different genres. So I, I don't want to squash your or box you in when it comes to creative work. Okay, thank you. Gina, how about you? What do you think? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, honestly, when I take somebody on, I tell them, be prepared to write at least three books in the genre that we're working in, because we have to build a readership before you jump to something else. I mean, unless they have immense amount of time and they can, I, mean, I have some authors who are able to write in more than one genre. They write as professionals. They do not have a day job. This is their day job. And they write 60, 70 hours a week. Most of us can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, if I sell a book for you that's a uh, middle grade, that publishing house is going to want that option book. And they may, it may be a two book contract to start with, and then you've got your option book. They're going to tie you up for a few years. So I usually tell people, expect to, to commit to multiple books in that genre in order to give yourself a shot at success. Because every time you jump genre, especially if it's substantial and you go from children's to adult, or you go from science fiction to 
thrillers or whatever, you're reinventing the wheel as far as your career is concerned. You're going to have very little carryover for readership from, from one of the genres to the other. Um, and you're going to have to start at ground zero to build your career. And, and quite honestly, I, I try to tell people, let's, let's have a conversation when we sign you. Let's talk about your ambitions, if you want, and how we should structure where you start in order to end up where you want to go. And, and let's see if we can build the books so that we can, in fact, take some of that readership to the next thing you want to do. If you want to do uh, you know, thrillers and science fiction, let's build a, th th a few thrillers and then let's do a sci-fi thriller. So we, at least we have some overlap. We can pull some of your readership in because it is so hard to start over again, pushing that rock up a hill over and over. I gotta tell you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that for sure. Priya, any, any words yes. to throw in here? Oh my gosh, I am 100% with Gina here. Um, you know, I, I, I cannot tell you how it's so hard to covet your, your audience, right? So if you are starting out as a debut especially, and, 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 and you come to me and you say, well, I want to be this and I want to be that. And, I, you know, it's exactly what Gina says, like figure out what you want to do and, and what you can do best first. And, and most often, you know, writing is not everybody's full-time job. They can't afford it, right? Like you, you have another full-time job and then you write. Um, but it's so important to really like establish yourself, right? What, like you have this opportunity, establish yourself. Oh my gosh, you have, you have to have your readership, right? Because you are selling to them. It is a business. It is an absolute business. Um, at the end of the day, the more books you sell, the, the fact that you can get second, third, fourth contract from the publisher are that much greater. Because remember, in some ways, it's really great to be a debut because you, you don't have a sales record. But the moment you publish, guess what? You're hit by that sales record because the second book you write, and if you don't have a two book deal, if you're writing literary fiction and, and your book sells like 250 copies, nobody's going to look at you, right? I mean, it's so it's, you have to be really, really smart and careful about it. And of course, I mean, look at J.K. Rowling. How long did she take, you know, when she wrote her, her other book under a nom de plume, right? God, she was a ridiculous success by then, right? So it's that, I mean, it's just, I would say, hone in on one thing, stay in it for some years. And if you're fairly successful at that, and it's exactly what Gina said, if the transition makes sense, do it, right? But, 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 but you have to do it with your eyes wide open. Uh, you know, don't be flippant to be like, I'll do a children's book to, uh, this year, and then next year I'm gonna do something completely like left field, so. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry, I don't mean, I don't mean to jump in, but my, um, so with it is, I'm, I just finished my third book um, that I wrote this year, um, and I'm starting my fourth one in November for NaNoWriMo, and I just wanted to kind of know if I should stay with, because I, I wrote I wrote an epic fantasy, I wrote a portal fantasy, and I wrote a um, uh, contemporary fantasy, and I was kind of wondering where I should move to next, because um, I want to, like, while I'm querying, I want to continue writing to push myself to the next level. Um, so. I'm just kind of curious as to where I should go because I have a list of 26 middle grade books that are outlined and ready for me to write. I just don't know which one to jump into. That's where my concern is. Sorry. Are the three, are the three books that you have all middle grade or are you, is this adult yeah. fantasy? Middle no, grade? they're all middle grade. Um, last year I spoke to an agent who told me I need to pick a, uh, a age group and I had two middle grade books that I was working on at that time. So it's when I went for middle grade. So I'm, I'm dead set on middle grade. I'm just not sure if I should stay in the, the single epic fantasy, or if I can do a contemporary, things like that. I, I don't think there's that much trouble if it's between epic portal and whatever the third one was you said. If you're a fantasy writer, it's the same editors. I don't think they're gonna go, oh wait, he wrote a portal fantasy, so now it's different. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that fine of a distinction matters. You're a fantasy, you're a middle grade fantasy writer, you're a middle grade fantasy writer. I don't think that's going to hold you back. Yeah, and would it really even matter that much if it was like epic fantasy or contemporary fantasy? I mean, it's all fantasy, right? Yeah. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, all right, we have like four minutes left. So I we have one la last question here from uh, Catherine Quillman. Um, Catherine, will you ask your question? Hi. 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 Sorry, I just, uh, I have to, um, I wasn't expecting to talk. I thought you were just going to read it. So could you? I, I'm happy to do that if you okay, want. Go ahead. Go ahead and read it. 
Okay. Um, so Catherine's asked, do you have, uh, do you have to query with a completed fiction manuscript? What if you, uh, have only the first chapter and a summary? And this is for fiction, right? So normally yes, that's fiction. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, Catherine, um, you, it, it, when you are ready to query, make sure that, that, that the manuscript is completed. Um, because but when you actually query, you have to uh, know what the agent wants. So their website will have all of the uh, submission mandates. And, and, once, and once you submit it, and if they ask for the full manuscript, then you should be ready to send it to them. Okay. Well, it's a, spe it's a historical novel. And uh, it's just that it, it's research-based and takes a lot of time. So I, not that I don't have it done or anything, but I just, I've had the whole thing plotted out, but only the first chapter. So I guess I'll have to wait till I finish it. Yes. That would be my recommendation, yes. Yeah. Okay. I can't, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry, Jem. You, you, uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, for me, it's, even if it's historical, your characters could surprise you and do something in those later chapters, which means you would have to revise that first chapter. So you shouldn't, you definitely shouldn't ever query and until you have a full, a full manuscript. That makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes the confusion comes um, with nonfiction. Frequently, you can query agents for a nonfiction book, um, and you have. Um, uh, oh, here we are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Can you mute yourself? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think part of the question is that you can, um, like, if you have a nonfiction book, you can. Um, Query an agent if you've got a first chapter and a synopsis and that sort of thing. So, um, well, but what confused me, but some someone said recently about they were going talking about the query letter and then you know saying that they you know what the uh, issue is, what the main characters were. But it makes sense, obviously. Uh, Great, not but then if they read your if Catherine if they read your query, they want to read your book. If your query is <laughs> you're gonna oh, yes, oh, that's just the first chapter okay you're gonna make them mad that's like pooping a bear don't do okay. that all right thanks <laughs> <laughs> okay um thank you all so much for this um it, I, i'm gonna ask our agents just uh we've got one minute left here if do you have any like final words of advice for our our authors before we segue into the reading portion of the of the panel and everyone brains explode from zoom exhaustion um, yes i do please <laughs> don't self-publish your book the second you get a rejection from somebody don't put a deadline on it don't say in your query if i don't hear yes from somebody in 30 days i'm self-publishing your book oh my gosh that, i see that all the time no 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 <laughs> unless that's your plan to self-publish then do that from the start can i um, tell my students that because i we had that conversation with my students too it makes it frustrating all my students who are on this call, so now you know. You heard it from an agent. There you go. And I want to I want to reinforce that and say, you know, we can only take each of us so many clients in a given time interval. We I don't know about the others, but I'm sure it's true. We see plenty of things that are fabulous all the time that we can't take, which means you have to keep querying until you hit an agent that will take it. But we're throwing back great stuff. Now I try to say that. But you know, those rejections that are champagne kind of frustrate people too. So, but yeah. I like to tell people, my gosh, this is fabulous. I don't want it. Um, it's frustrating, but just, just keep going. Don't, don't assume from a few rejections that there's a problem or even from a year of rejections or whatever. If you have a good project and you believe in it, keep going. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear from Jem and Priya too. Um, for me, it's, you know, constantly study your craft, pick your favorite books and open them. And this time don't read them for pleasure, but like actually study what they're doing, the conventions that are there and figure out something, figure out how you can bring that, that kind of that air, that tone, that's that breathable space to your own pages. Thank you. 
Yeah, and, and, and yes, and finally to add, um, you know, be kind to yourselves. It's it's um, writing is a very very tough thing. It's solitary. It's um, it's it's kind of punishing, and there's a lot of self doubt. Um, you know, and, and especially when you see what's out there, um, it's very hard. So know that agents are here really for you guys, um, and uh, and just really be kind to yourselves and don't give up. It's taken me two years to sell a book. Guess what? It can take you two years to find the right agent. So don't give up and be kind to yourselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, uh, ladies. I really, really appreciate your time um, all day, hanging in there with me in Zoom Room 5, like a maniac, and then coming back and, and giving us all some of your, uh, your words of wisdom. I wanna say thank you um, to all of our panelists, to to all of our attendees, to everyone who's made this um, effort today uh, to share a push to publish with us at Philadelphia Stories and Rosemont College. We appreciate it. Like we really need this time together as artists, as writers, um, as creators, and um, really thank you, thank you so much. So I'm gonna ask everyone to do the jazz hands and let's uh, give each other some, some love and applause. And if, you, if you've got it in you, hang around for another half hour um, we're going to take a five minute um, bathroom break and then we're going to come back and we're going to do the McGlynn contest winners. You want to hear some good writers? These guys are fantastic. So five minutes, everyone, and we'll be, we'll be right back. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. We're going to get started uh, about 5, 10, I think. I just want to wait another couple minutes just to make sure that everyone who is in the poetry panel that wants to come over has an opportunity to do that. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Just another couple minutes. <clears throat> Well, normally at this time, we would all uh, probably have a little glass of wine. Um, I'm going to wait because I think once it passes my lips, I might just go like this. <laughs> so. I do have a little something. It's kind of early, but you know, in the spirit of it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There you go, Trish. <laughs> she too. Yeah. It's happy hour somewhere, right? That's <laughs> so. Close enough. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. All right, it is 10 minutes after five. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, once again, thank you all for attending and being a part of Push to Publish today. Um, this is just really fantastic. Um, I'm sorry that we did not get to celebrate um, our winning author uh, in the style in which we normally do, having a big dinner in their honor and giving them a check in person and all that good stuff. But the one nice thing about doing it this way is that we are able to have our second and third place winners also read for you today. So I'm very, I'm very happy uh, to be able to do that. And uh, Karen, Dion has graciously decided to hang out with us for the whole day. So that's really amazing. Um, and she is going to introduce each of the authors and then, um, say a little bit about their story. She was our judge this year and uh, Trish Rodriguez and I put our heads together and we sent her seven final stories. Uh, normally, uh, sometimes we send it up as, as many as 10, but Trish and I were kind of on the fence about a bunch of them. So we just decided to send our seven favorites and there were over 450 submissions. So that says something. Um, and normally at this time, I'd also like to just take a minute and talk about Marguerite McGlynn, who is the woman that the contest is named after. Um, I was able to uh, write something about Marguerite in our um, in my letter to the editor in this issue. Marguerite was a, a 
very special person that we lost um, too early to cancer. And uh, she died of pancreatic cancer. And um, my stepmother also passed away from pancreatic cancer this um, spring, actually about a week before the lockdown uh, in March. And um, so I've been reflecting a lot about both of these women and in particular, Marguerite, um, who was um, a really special person and she was very supportive of other writers. Um, she was just a warm and generous person. And uh, Christine and I will always be grateful to the McGlynn family, to Tom, her husband, and the rest of the family, uh, the Hansmas, who financially support this prize so generously um, and support the magazine in so many crucial uh, and important ways. So I don't, I didn't want to let this pass because I'm sure, I know that there are a few people on the call who knew Marguerite and, um, um, but many of you never had the opportunity to meet her and she was really, a really special person. So um, before I get too much more worked up, I'm going to introduce Karen Dion. Um, so Karen Dion has been our special guest this weekend and uh, it's just been so wonderful. And I hope someday, Karen, I get to meet you in the in the flesh and we're able to um, shake hands without uh, worrying about having to go to the hospital afterwards. So um, that is my hope. Um, if you don't know already, Karen Dion is the USA Today and number one international best-selling author of The Marsh King's Daughter, a psychological suspense novel set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness, published by G.P. Put G. Putnam and Sons in the U.S. and in 25 other languages. Her uh, newest psychological thriller, The Wicked Sister, uh, was published August 4th. So uh, they're terrific books. And if you're a fan of such things, uh, you really, I'm telling you, you will, you will love them. Um, Karen also enjoys nature photography, lives with her husband in Detroit's northern suburbs. Now, before I hand this over to Karen, I'm going to ask everyone except for Karen to mute your microphones, please, so that we don't get any extraneous background noise. Silence. Thank you. All right, Karen, take it away. Well, hello, everyone. And, you know, I just want to say a couple of things before we get right into introducing our contest winners. And one thing is that judging this contest, oh my goodness, it was both a challenge and a delight because I loved reading the stories, but then, you know, you have to rank the stories and, and ranking is always so subjective. And of course, the stories that I, I was sent were the best of the best, you know, the best of all of those 400 entries. And then to narrow it down still further, you know, the, the differences were so close. And so I just want to say to, to all three of you, you know, kudos for writing just a truly wonderful short story. You deserve every, every accolade, you know, anyone could possibly bring your way. I also want to apologize in advance because we didn't have a chance to mix and mingle like we normally would, and I couldn't verify how you pronounce your name. So if I mess up, I sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with um, David L. Uppetyke. Uh, his, he's the, our third place winner, and his st short story was called Feral Wives. David is a writer and editor based in Philadelphia. His work has appeared in Grimoire, Daily Science Fiction, and 365 Tomorrows, among other venues. A member of the Bucks County Writers Workshop, he edited the first two issues of the group's literary and historical journal, again, the pronunciation, Neshamini. A longtime museum publishing professional, he is currently director of publications at the Barnes Foundation. He lives in Wincott with his wife, daughter, and more books than they could possibly ever read. And before I ask David to read a sample of his writing, I just want to say that I found the short story, Feral Wives, the premise was irresistible because what it is about is women all over the country are leaving their families, not just their husbands, but their children's as well, to live in groups in the forest. And they're constantly on the move, building temporary shelters, they're hunting and fishing and foraging. Why, of course, you know, is a big question early on in the story, but it's a really thoughtful and engaging commentary on what it would mean 
to get rid of the label of wife and mother and perhaps make a new life for yourself. So David, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, and I just want to say that um, I reread the stories by Ali and AC this afternoon as well. And, I, and in addition to seeing some really interesting parallels um, among them, um, I just want to say it's a real honor to be included in such great uh, literary company. Um, I also want to thank Carla and everyone at uh, Philadelphia Stories who put this conference and the publication and the contest together every year, um, as well as the McGlynn and Hansma families. Because it's so important for writers to have opportunities. That's why you're all here, I'm sure. Um, and it's just, it's, it's so important right now, particularly, I think. Um, uh, Karen kind of set up the premise for the story. So, and, and the first section kind of repeats that a little bit, but I'm just gonna launch right in. So uh, this is The Feral Wives. The feral wives have left us, that much is clear. What is less clear is why and for how long. Surely their absence must be an aberration, a temporary detour from the slow, steady march of civilization. For how would we go on without them and they without us? We know so little, their means of survival, their patterns of migration, their social structure, if they can be said to have one, all remain mysterious. We have learned that they tend to travel in groups of six to 12, though communities of 20 or more are not unknown. They prefer to stay on the move, building temporary shelters from the materials close at hand and then disassembling them, so that the only traces they leave behind might be a pile of sticks and leaves, a charcoal pit, a few bones. And yes, they hunt, fish, and trap, though we have little idea how, since they do not appear to be armed in the conventional sense. They seem to know things that we have lost and to have lost things that we know. We were at a rest stop somewhere in Ohio when Katrina finally bolted. She'd been slumped over in the passenger seat all morning, face pressed against the glass, staring out at the monotonous landscape of fields, farms, and factories scrolling by on the turnpike. I was at the wheel trying to put as many miles as possible behind us with the vague notion that a change of scene might mean a change of outcome. The girls rode in the back, uncharacteristically quiet, Chelsea clinging to her phone, Greta to Mr. Tittles, her stuffed rabbit. They were anxious, looking to us for cues on this odd, unexpected journey. I had none to offer. To the extent that I had a plan, it was to keep driving west, chasing the sun until it set, then find a cheap motel for the night, rinse and repeat, I'd thought maybe we could outrun destiny, and if not, then at least we'd be on the run as a unit. Or maybe we'd just keep going all the way to the Pacific, and then what? Something made Katrina perk up. She raised her head and squared her shoulders, the muscles on the back of her neck tensing. I stole a sideways glance out the passenger window to see what might have caught her attention, but it was just the same thing we'd been seeing for hours. Rows of soy and corn stretching into the distance, punctuated by an occasional barn or silo. Perhaps sensing my gaze, she turned to face me. Her eyes, curtained by wisps of her long, blonde, going to gray hair, were open wide, pupils dilated. She was looking not at me, but right through me, beyond me, to something that wasn't there, or not yet there, though I had the feeling that the sheer intensity of her gaze could almost bring it into being. Not for the first time in recent weeks, I also had the visceral sense that I was no longer looking at my wife of 14 years, but at a complete stranger. God knows what she saw when she looked back at me. The angry blast of a truck horn in the left lane snapped my attention back to the road. I'd been drifting and I jerked the wheel to the right as an oil tanker whizzed by mere inches away. What is it, Dad, said Chelsea, her voice tight with worry. What happened? At nine to her sister's four, Chelsea had become their spokesperson for the trip. It's fine, honey, I told her. I was just getting a little too close to that truck, so he was letting me know. Mom, what were you looking at over there, she asked. Nothing, said Katrina absently. Go back to sleep. Neither girl had slept a wink since we'd left our home in Harrisburg in the early dawn. I have to pee, said Greta. How bad, Muffin, I asked. Can you wait a little while? Kind of bad, she said. In the rearview mirror, I could see her squirming in her seat. She hugged Mr. Tittles so tightly that his torso slumped forward, his long ears drooping over her tiny thighs. I sighed. Okay, let me see what I can do. 
I'd been holding on myself since at least Pittsburgh and had finally reached that point of Zen where my angry bladder seemed to belong to someone else. Now with the prospect of relief, the urgency returned. I saw a sign ahead promising a rest stop in five miles. Hang in there, I told Greta, taking the Subaru up to 80 to pass a row of cars and trucks in the right-hand lane. In four minutes flat, we were pulling into the Muskingum County rest area. We drove past a long line of stock tractor trailers and turned into one of the angled parking spaces for cars. Ahead, up a paved walkway, was the visitor center, a low concrete building with a flying saucer-shaped metal roof. A path to the right led to a pavilion with a few empty picnic tables, beyond which lay grassy hills with stands of tall oak, and beyond that, the woods. A cell tower loomed out of the trees like a sentry. Okay, let's go, I said, opening the door and unfolding my stiff legs. By the time I stood up, Chelsea and Greta were already out of the car on their way up, on their way up the sidewalk, Greta pulling her older sister by the hand toward the glass doors of the visitor center. I poked my head inside the car. Are you coming? I asked Katrina. I don't want them running off alone. They'll be okay, she said, not looking up. They're survivors, Steve. All righty then, I said, not wanting to argue the point. Do you want anything? Coffee? A snack? She shook her head. We may not stop for a while after this. It's best to keep moving, she said. Suit yourself. I pushed the door closed and hurried up the path. We'd had a lot of disconnected conversations like this lately, and I was running out of patience. So apparently was she. The bathroom stop turned into a snack run, which was quickly upgraded to lunch. And then I couldn't resist getting in line at the Starbucks for an iced mocha latte, my one weakness. By the time we emerged from the building, laden with greasy bags and sweaty drinks, Katrina was gone. Not only that, but she'd left the passenger door wide open with all of our stuff in plain view of anyone wandering by. Where's mom, asked Greta. I guess she went for a walk, I said. She'd left her phone in the cup holder between the seats and her suitcase was still with the others in the luggage compartment. I scanned the surrounding area, but saw no sign of her. A wave of panic rose from my gut to my chest and lodged there. I didn't want to alarm the girls, so I said, let's go over to the picnic tables. We can eat our lunch while we wait for her to come back. She didn't come back. Maybe she's inside looking for us, I said, though I didn't really believe it. Let's go check. We dumped the remains of our picnic into the waste bin and headed for the building. Several couples passed us on their way out, retirees in tennis shoes and oversized sweatshirts, the kind of people you saw on the road in late September. We attracted looks of curiosity and concern. One of the women leaned over and whispered something to her husband, then gave the girls a sympathetic nod. Save your pity, I thought, we'll be fine. The visitor center was humming with activity as people headed in every direction at once, alone and in clumps. I looked around the place and saw no sign of Katrina. I sent the girls into the women's room, but they returned without their mother. We combed the food court to no avail. I asked some of the employees if they'd seen a 40-ish woman in jeans and a fuzzy brown sweater. Not much to go on, I realized, but we had to try. They just shrugged. Greta began to cry, and Chelsea took her by the hand. More people were staring at us now, more whispers and knowing looks. She must be outside, I said. Come on, let's go, girls. We walked the perimeter of the rest area where the mown grass gave way to woods, calling Katrina and mom at the top of our lungs. The dark, silent forest swallowed our cries. The only other sound was the rumble of trucks out on the highway. I saw no paths or obvious points of entry, just weeds and underbrush, thorns and poison ivy. Discarded candy wrappers, styrofoam cups, and plastic bags had blown up against the edge of the wood, like sea foam washed up by the tide. The idea of stepping over them and into that dense mess of foliage with the girls in tow made me deeply uneasy. So did the idea of leaving them standing there at the edge of the wood. We went over the entire rest area twice, then returned to the car and sat with the windows down. Greta continued crying and sniffling while Chelsea stroked her sister's hair and I sat in the front thinking about next steps. It was Chelsea who finally broke the silence. We lost her dad, she said. It sounded like an accusation. Thank you, everybody.
Yeah, David, that I, I know everybody else feels as I do. That's so moving and so beautifully written and so engaging. So thank you for, for reading it. And well, thank you for writing it as well. So um, yeah, so now we'll move on to Ali Mariano, um, our second place winner. Her short story is called The Dead Women. And Allie's writing has appeared in a lot of literary journals too. Uh, Cut Bank, The Citron Review, Another okay. Chicago She's Magazine, kidding. New Orleans, The Times Picayune, and other places. This year, her short story collection, Dead Women and Other Stories, was a finalist for the Black Lawrence Press Hudson Prize. When she's not writing or teaching, she can be found biking in the Uchita Forest. <laughs> I'm not from Pennsylvania, as you can probably tell. <laughs> okay, so um, Allie's story really touched me because I love a, a story about a character who's at a crossroads because, you know, you, you don't know what brought them to that point. You That's assume scary. you'll find out in, during the story. But then what will they do? You know, which direction will they go? Okay. And um, hope, you know, you hope that the writer or the character will make better choices in the future. This story is so beautifully written. Allie, your word choices were just stunning. And so um, every, every word was a delight. And now our audience will get to hear some of those. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And um, I wanted to thank y'all for having me. Um, Thank you, Carla and Trish, for not being too disturbed by my story and passing it on. <laughs> um, and thank you, Karen, um, for selecting it. I'm so thrilled to be here and um, to be included in Philadelphia stories. Um, and then thank you also to the McGlynn and Henson families um, for supporting the prize. And then also just not to just completely echo um, David, but I'm just like excited to be here with you guys too. Um, and I'm going to say one more thing. Um, I, I live in Arkansas now, but this story takes place um, on the highway between Lake Charles and Lafayette, Louisiana. And that area has been hit really incredibly hard by a hurricane. They have another storm coming through right now. And if you are able in any way to support people in that community, um, please do, because they haven't gotten as much press. So um, I just wanted to kind of say that because those are my people. So um, anyway, okay, sorry, I'm going to, I'll read the story or a part of it. Okay, this is Dead Women. The dead women are the topic of conversation at dinner. One in a dumpster, one a hunter found in the wooded swamp outside of town, one with a hand that had fallen open, palm asking, please, please don't forget me. One in a river, three in a swamp, some degraded beyond recognition. The most recent on the side of I-10, altogether eight women, all of them sex workers, white girls and black girls, found in Jennings, New Iberia, Iowa, Louisiana. It is not the conversation for polite company, but Maura and John pride themselves on the subversive. Of course, these dead women will be discussed over moderately priced cabs. I love this about them. Maura and John host, Maura, a history professor at the local university, and John, a ke chemical engineer at one of the plants. Some of the guests I know and some I do not. It is the end of Maura's semester and they were so happy when I arrived. They demanded I stay the night. You could head out first thing. You could at least have coffee with us. Once I would have acquiesced, but tonight I'm only thinking of my trip back home, willing myself to stay sober enough to drive. Just an hour, east on I-10, a straight shot home to Lafayette. On the table sits a big bowl of potato salad, yellow and shining. I watch it while the others stand around the table, chatting and watching Maura and John. Maura has tight, dark curls and a face that isn't quite pretty, but she is smart and loud and funny and it doesn't matter. From the corner where I stand in the dining room, I can see Maura standing over the stove, telling her husband that the pot is too hot to set on the table. A towel, she yells, it'll burn through. Who's the scientist, doctor, John replies. He is tall and all arms and legs. He towers over her and she looks up at him with her hands on her hips. I take a seat at the table, put my purse on the chair back and stare at a bottle of wine. I want more, but I think of the cops monitoring the highway home. Finally, 
John marches out of the kitchen, holding the boil pot with pot holders on both of his hands. Mara fusses behind him with a hot plate and a salad. She puts the hot plate down just by the potato salad and then drapes the towel across it and folds it back over, a sacred ceremony. She gestures to her husband, put down the damn pot. There is comfort in the steaming pot, the scent of thick broth, of venison sausage, of pulled chicken. Sit, Mora commands the guests. They mill about and make moves toward the table. Go sit by Aaron. Mora pushes a man near my age. He is also tall and thin, a young John with shaggy hair. He looks down, but he obeys. I feel my phone buzz in my purse, against, my purse against my chair back. Maybe to Sam, and I want to go home to him. Mora carries bowls of rice from the kitchen and places them in front of the people at the table. And altogether, we are 12. With my bowl in front of me, I ignore this man to my side, and I ladle gumbo into my bowl. I take a large spoon of potato salad and throw it on top. This first bite is life-affirming. No decision I make today is so crucial that it can't be changed. It is thick and silky and salty. Mora ho hovers over the table, making sure everyone has filled a bowl before she fills her own. And John watches his wife. Brown gravy dots his beard. Aaron, Adam, Adam, Aaron, Mora says, taking her seat at the head of the table. Adam is the man beside me. Adam is John's nephew and a chemical engineer too. He interviewed at Sitgo yesterday. I smile and he gives a small wave. I'm not sure I want to leave Texas, he says. Mora waves this away. You'll love it here. He starts to speak, but someone yells down the table to Mora. The girl on the highway, her throat was slit. Who do you think killed her? Her arms were covered in bruises, says someone else. I feel a creeping feeling in my stomach, drawing away from the heat from the gumbo. I refill my wine glass a third time. Mara, Mara shakes her head. Conspiracy. Serial killer, John calls from the kitchen. It's a serial killer. All of those girls dead in a 30 mile radius. Mora crosses her arms and sits back. Her throat was slit. Someone didn't want her to speak. We are talking about eight dead prostitutes, Mora. Doesn't that sound like a Jack the Ripper? She waves her arms at him and she waves her arms at him. She's drunk. Their innards aren't decorating the highway. Serial killers like a show. I'm glad I'm not a young woman, one of the other teachers says. They are almost all under 30. It's a cover up, says Mora. You have to know these towns. That many dead girls? Women, I think. I do not want to think about dead girls or dead women. I want to think about Sam, who wanted me to stay home to begin with. His wife is out of town for the whole weekend. And I'm not too drunk to drive, I think. I know which exits the cops hang out at. I resolve to stick to the speed limit. I knew about the previous murders and I wasn't afraid. They were all sex workers. They worked out at the same hotel. They had rap sheets, drug habits. Crimes like this just remind you that they can happen, but just not to you. The guests carry on. They mention neck bruises, the particular mix of semen in the vagina, the dirt and blood under the nails. My stomach turns again. This morning, Sam asked me why I wanted to hang out with those old people. We were lying in my bed and his arm was around my shoulder, his other hand moving slowly down my stomach. I didn't bother mentioning that he was closer to their age than mine. They're my friends, I said. I haven't seen them in months. Come with me. He laughed at this. Of course he wasn't going to come. I'm going, I said. Back at the table, someone says, what about the slit throat? I feel like this dinner will never end. I want my little studio apartment. I want to curl up with Sam and spend a slow Sunday morning with sunny side eggs and black coffee. I think about my apartment. It's my own, without roommates, above a garage, one big room and a tiny bathroom. I feel years have passed since I lived in Lake Charles, even though it was just one. My parish jobs pay, job pays more than any job before, and I don't miss the years I spent there. Grad school, low paying jobs, it was easy living, late dive bar nights, weekends at camp houses on the big lake, a far cry from my Tennessee home. My apartment is now my haven. 
full of crazy mid-century furniture inherited from an aunt, a wooden cabinet with an art deco inlay, two short puffy little chairs that almost curved all the way around you, a wooden desk with hairpin legs. I bought a couch and a bed for myself. It is cozy. I love it because it is my own, because I have the entire say in how it looks, because I can see every corner at once. I feel safe. Amidst the chatter of murder and conspiracy theories, I want nothing more than to be home, door locked to the world. Hello. Maura is standing at the head of the table. Aaron? Sorry, what? What do you think? Serial killer or conspiracy? It's really grim, isn't it, I ask, talking about them at dinner. It's current events, she says. She's not the least bit worried. I don't know. I don't know if, enough about it, I say. You should wildly speculate like the rest of us, John says, and he is smiling and sensing my unease. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, you can finish reading it on the website. And I'm sure you all want to. The best part is yet to come. <laughs> but uh, I love the shiny potato salad. There were so many details in that story that just really uh, popped for me. So thank you, Allie, very much. Um, now we get to move on to Andrew. Um, I saw in your bio, it was AC Coke. Do you say Coke or and uh, now I see your first name is Andrew. So that's a lot more friendlier than calling you AC. <laughs> so um, Andrew, AC Koch is a two-time Pushcart Prize nominee whose work has been published in literary journals such as Mississippi Review, Exquisite Corpse, The Columbia Journal, and Friction. A story of his was selected by Robert Olin Butler to win the Raymond Carver Short Story Award at Carve Magazine in 2003. In addition to short fiction, he is an aspiring novelist and recently completed a draft of a generation spanning story about a small group of humans leaving a dying earth to settle a new planet. He lives in Denver, Colorado, which, where he teaches linguistics at the graduate level and makes music with first timers, a power pop ensemble. And Andrew's short story, Young Americans, oh my goodness, it spoke to me on so many different levels and for me, it did everything that a short story is supposed to do. It, it sucked me right in. There was an economy of language, an easy rhythm and flow. That's from the technical side. From um, a more organic side, the subject matter was very appealing, a father-daughter story. Um, I won't tell too much about it. I'll let him go ahead and start reading, and then you all can enjoy it too. Thanks so much, Karen. I, I really appreciate that introduction so much. Um, and thanks uh, to uh, um, Carla and Trish and everybody at Philadelphia Stories, all the wonderful uh, writers uh, and staff members there. I feel like I'm dreaming still to be here uh, among you. And uh, one of the reasons I submitted was because I really wanted to go to Philadelphia. <laughs> so I still have to do that someday. I have some good friends there. But it is such a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you all here uh, virtually. Um, thanks to the McGlynn family uh, and, the, and the Hansma family as well for, for uh, supporting this wonderful opportunity for writers. Um, to David and Ali, my goodness, today I reread your stories uh, again, um, and I'm, I'm blown away to be, uh, to be in, in your company. Um, what tremendous craft, what fantastic stories. Um, if I had had to choose uh, amongst our three, I wouldn't have put mine first, I can tell you that. Um, uh, so, so thank you, and, and uh, it's an honor to be, to be uh, reading with you. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to say before I read a, a short section from the beginning of my story is, um, Karen, when I, was, um, when I saw the call for submissions, I had already collected several rejection stories from Philadelphia, Stor or rejection notes from Philadelphia stories, but when I saw the call for submissions, um, I did some Googling, um, and I hadn't read The Marsh King's Daughter, um, but I read a synopsis of it, and I discovered that the father-daughter uh, relationship was kind of central to that story. And I thought, oh, I've been working on a father-daughter story. So I put some work into revising that and polishing it up, and that was Young Americans. I sent it in. Um, I'm kind of glad that I didn't read Marsh King's Daughter before I did that, because I've read it since. Um, and I feel like if uh, it's such a masterful novel uh, with the parallel storylines and the father-daughter dynamic and so much emotion and psychology built in, 
I probably wouldn't have had the nerve to send in my story if I had already read it <laughs> before submitting. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your faith in, in, in my work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're very kind. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I guess the, the last thing I want to say uh, before beginning is I think it's interesting that in all three of our stories, um, peril on the highway is uh, one of the themes. I think that's really interesting. Maybe we're, we're sensing something floating in the air, some sense of powerlessness or aggression somewhere in, in the world around us. I think that's really interesting. So I'll start with, uh, with that scene that opens on the highway. Young Americans. What was the one thing he couldn't do without? Like if he was stuck on a desert island forever. He knew his answer right away, but took a few moments to ponder so he didn't seem so strident. A pencil and a sketchbook, I think. Sorry, Raquel said, but that's two things. The point is you can only choose one. Harry smirked at her, so alert in her posture at the driver's wheel, a textbook pose from her driver's ed class. You can't have one without the other. They're an essential pairing. I don't make the rules, Dad. Only one thing. Well, if it's a desert island, I guess I only need a stick so I can draw in the sand. She threw her head back and laughed without taking her eyes off the road. You can say anything in the world and all you want is a stick? He showed his palms. Hey, I'm a simple man. What would you choose, a graphing calculator? She peeled her eyes off the road to roll them at him. With her math mind and zeal for detail, about to embark on a degree in civil freaking engineering, she would surely be able to build a beautiful house on her desert island. But maybe he'd sounded sarcastic. He was about to take it back when she said, I need my music. So an iPod or something. Just a device with all my music on it that never runs out of power. Don't you also need headphones? That's two things. No. It's just a device that plays any music I want, anytime I want. Okay, so a transistor radio with an infinite library of tunes. I guess so, but it has to have really good sound. So you invented a magical device with access to every song ever recorded, but I can't have a sketchbook to go with my pencil? She made an I regret to inform you face at the road and shrugged. It was the kind of conversation that could last them all the way to California, which was the whole point of this road trip a last bout of father-daughter bonding before she vanished into college and California and adulthood. He didn't know if she was feeling as melancholy about it as he was. How could she, with all the excitement and possibility? But he felt like he was visiting a beloved house for the last time, turning off the lights, closing all the doors. Movement in the mirror caught his eye with a spike of adrenaline, a truck's grill and headlight completely filling the side view mirror. He twisted around to look out the hatchback. The front end of a very large, late model Ford pickup surged at the window, less than a car length back. Raquel, both hands gripping the wheel, shot glances in her rear view. Holy shit, he came out of nowhere. He's way too close, Harry said, teeth clenched. Their cruise control was set at 65, precisely the speed limit on this gently curving stretch of desert highway. The center line was dashed with no oncoming traffic and there was no reason why the truck couldn't just pass. Harry lowered his window. Wind battered their cocoon as he jutted an arm out to wave them around. The truck fell back, then gunned ahead, coming within inches of their back bumper. Steady, Rocky. He reached over to kill the cruise control. Let it slow by itself, hands on the wheel, nice and steady. The truck fell back again, then surged forward and cut sharply to the side. With a burst of throaty engine roar, it passed. Someone in the passenger seat banged on the truck's door as it zoomed by, with shouts that were torn away in the wind. With an abrupt lurch, it pulled back into their lane and sped away, middle fingers flying from both windows. Jesus, Raquel said, slumping but keeping her hands at ten and two. You're fine, Harry said in a calm voice, even as his heart slammed. You did great. Just slow down, let him get some distance. You should have wished for a gun instead of a stick. They pulled off at the next town to switch drivers and ended up scarfing a dinner of beef jerky, corn chips, and soda pop on a picnic table beside a gas station. A galaxy of moths pinwheeled around the Conoco sign in the twilight. Harry was counting off in his head how many more meals he was going to have with his daughter. This might be their second to last one, he thought as he chewed. 
In two days, everything would be different and irreversible. He didn't say anything about that because why paint, some, why paint someone else with your own shadows? It was another hour to Minden, the town where he'd reserved two rooms in a boutique hotel. Harry drove with his eyes flicking from shoulder to, shoulder to shoulder and mirror to mirror, alert for crossing animals and road warrior pickups. Antelope stood bright-eyed and frozen off in the brush and small critters zipped across the pavement. He slowed when they came around a bend and saw the strobing lights of a police cruiser at the side of the road. An ambulance was just pulling away, flashing and shrieking and heading back towards the freeway. Harry slowed to a crawl as a cop standing by the squad car's bumper waved them past. Their heads swiveled as they went by. A, a compact car lay on its crushed roof at the end of a rutted debris trail about 30 feet off the road. Yellow caution tape demarcated the whole area. Dad, Raquel breathed. He knew what she was thinking, but he didn't want to say it. She did. Those assholes in the pickup ran somebody off the road. You think so? They were just looking for it. She twisted around to stare at the wreckage, even as Harry sped up. He wanted to tell her to look away and keep the sight of car wrecks out of her head, the same way he tried to ignore a TV in a bar. Why fill yourself with garbage and pain? But he didn't want to nag. Besides, she had a good head on her shoulders. She could decide what she paid attention to. In the mirror, the ambulance sped away, a UFO streaking across the desert. I'll stop there. Thanks, everyone. That was really wonderful. Carla, I, I just want to say a minute of words before I turn it over to you. And that's, you know, on a personal note, I, again, I want to thank the three winners for sharing your work with us and enabling me to, to enjoy, you know, that little moment of getting absorbed in someone else's story. It's just such a delight. And um, congratulations to you all. I wish we were meeting in person and, and could uh, chat together face to face, but uh, this is wonderful. And thank you, Carla, for having me uh, as part of the Push to Publish conference. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I want Christine Weiser to like say something so that everyone can see her face. All right, Hi. Christine? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I it. Carla and I have been in separate rooms all day. So uh, hi, Carla, good to see you. <laughs> hey, Christine. So for those of you who don't know, like, um, Christine is really the heart and soul and brains uh, in Philadelphia Stories. She's our executive director. And the two of us together, uh, 17 years ago, decided we would, we would make a literary magazine. And then a year later, we published our first issue. And so here we are 16 years later uh, with the likes of all of you, which is, which is really spectacular. And I, I don't know that Christine and I, all those years ago, um, ever thought we would well we certainly didn't think we'd be doing it like this today on on online but i don't know that we really imagined um all the incredible people and all the amazing writers we have an opportunity to meet and uh, celebrate and so um anyway i wanted to make sure everybody saw christine's face because like i said we've we've been in separate christine said we've been in separate zoom rooms all all day so here we are finally together yeah, it was a terrific day, and I'm so grateful for everybody who participated as uh, attendees and speakers. And Karen, I'm sorry we didn't get to meet because I we all also are really looking forward to meeting you. So um, anyway, but this will do. Right. I I keep thinking of um, I, I'm not Jewish. I've been to a few Seder meals, and I always think of the toast and next year in Jerusalem. And I hope that's not too sacrilegious, but um, that's, uh, it's the sentiment, I hope, that, you know, next year we'll be able to meet again, and um, so that, that's what I, I, I hope for, and um, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming and sharing your work. I will leave the room open for anybody who wants to hang out and chat for a little bit. Um, I may have to go get a glass of wine. I'm not gonna lie. So, um, but I'll leave it over for, oh, open for at least a 15 minutes if anybody wants to hang out and chat. And so, um, thank you all once again. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.